All right, today we're going to look at the Asgard Sampler 2 from Frostwave Audio. This is an update from the original Asgard Sampler. You might know this if you're in the know of like folk or Viking music. Uh, if you listen to stuff like War Druna or anything like that, there is an artist called Danheim who basically has created instruments like this um, for sale for many years. And I think Frostwave Audio is a new uh, company that uh, he's created with somebody. I actually don't really know. The person that I was discussing with was Rydar which is about as Viking as it gets, <laughs> which is its real name, so it's kind of funny. So uh, it's an updated instrument. I think it's combining a lot of the elements of the Asgard sampler, the previous one, into one uh, unit, uh, a bit easier to use, and also with an updated Terminator engine, as you can see down here. Um, so basically, I'm just going to do a rundown of all the instruments I used, how I uh, worked with it, and uh, some things that I feel could use some improvement. Um, and some things that maybe I would say I was a little disappointed in. Uh, so just an overall review of the plugin. In general, though, big fan of the plugin, and thank you very much to Rydar and Frostwave Audio for uh, sponsoring this video. All right, so I have 10 instances here of various um, tracks, okay? And these are all separate instruments. In Cubase, I like to load everything uh, with the instrument rack here and actually in this particular case except for the drums and bass i believe no drums as well um it's just a single track instrument which means that there's no multiple output routing available so it's just a single track so i have 10 different tracks each track is its own separate piece of audio i've opted really not to do a lot of eq or a lot of post processing i wanted to make a really neutral sounding or hey this is what things sound like out of the box and, and instead of trying to butter everything up to make it sound super great the only thing I did here was I put a reviver from black salt audio on here it's like a little bit of a I this is a bad terminology in Jordan it probably would kill me if you heard me say this it's like a good riser <laughs> for synths and keyboards it just just some upper high harmonic saturation just it helps it cut through the mix a bit more, you know, when I use it for black metal stuff. Um, and then Black Hole, which is my go-to reverb. You guys know about this for years. The stock setting, sync to the BPM, just change the mix. There you go. Um, and we have something like this. With all the instruments. So there's nothing else going on. All the that's just the instrument itself. Uh, a couple of things about the instrument. If we look at the instrument now, as you can see here, there's three different layers. So aside from just picking a preset, if you were to do that, there's uh, three layers where you can combine instruments however you wish, and then obviously that you would play them down here on the keyboard. Pretty cool to where you can come up with your own, basically your own instrument, your own idea. And once you get a really good idea of you know what um, instruments are available here in terms of sounds and textures and things like that, you can come up with your own uh, stuff. So choose a sample, put it on a different layer. Uh, you can change everything about that particular sam uh, sample, the ADSR stuff. You know, so attack, delay, sustain, release knobs, volume, pan, pitch, and tuning. Very important to have all these things because one of the things that I found, I believe it was. It was one of these Rohan strings, or I don't know. I think it might have been the Deerbone flute, um, where basically um, something was definitely out of pitch while in relationship to the other instrument that I was being played in. So I had to fine tune it with the pitch. So you have the pitch control, and then you can fine tune it even more in sense, which is was very important to do. Then here you have. EQ filter types for low end and and um, the the, the it's, it's all self-explanatory and actually they have tool tips right up here which is great they have the filter type the frequency of the filter etc etc uh, the LFO waveform if you want to reverse the sample it's all right here you can just read it off the top frequency of it the fade in tempo sync it reverse it uh, so there's a lot of functionality for each layer that you can work with so you really can come up with really unique sounds and it's great for sound design all right so you have three different layers here 
this side over here, the same thing, LFO uh, module, I didn't even see this until like the second day I was working with this. I didn't use it. I experimented with it a little bit. You can just create um, a synth wave, uh, various synth waves here, and then mix it in into the layer that you have going on here. Cool. I mean, I didn't do anything with it, but you can, you have two different oscillators. You can detune them. Kind of do very basic synth design, wave, tab wave, wave table synthesis stuff. That's pretty neat. But I don't know, like, you're, you, it'll be useful to you. I don't know. Uh, you've got LFO here, which can, mm, how can I call this? Like, in, like, introduces movement, um, cutoffs, um, syncing to the, uh, tempo of your project could be cool for dynamic stuff. Again, I didn't even use this module. I didn't even notice it until I was, it was like the second day working with this with this plugin. On the bottom side here, we have phase reverb delay filter again, uh, saturation and an EQ module. I think this is fantastic because one of the things that I did when I was working with all these uh, different uh, samples, for example is I make heavy use of the reverb. Now, one of the tricks that I'll use when I'm mixing is to try and glue everything together, as it were. I will use a single reverb and push everything through that single reverb so everything sounds like it's in the same room, quote-unquote. That doesn't mean you, you can only use that one reverb for everything. You could use a different reverb on the snare or a different reverb on your rooms. But pushing the entire mix through a single reverb so it all retains the same sound is just a trick that I've been doing for many years. Um, so I absolutely use the same reverb here. I just changed the, the mix and the size of it to change how I wanted it to be in the mix of the song. Now with reverb, actually, you can change how close or something is far away in the song by using the size of the reverb. So that was like one of the first steps I took into placement of the instruments, right? Like, oh, this is too much in front of my face. Let me move that back a little bit, okay? We've got delay, we've got the filter. Now, the one thing about the filters, like they have low pass, high pass, notches. Okay, I mean, this is more like, feels more like wavetable synthesis stuff, more expert level things where I don't even know what I would use this for. I mean, I'm not a wavetable synthesis expert. I'm not even a synth expert. So for me, I just look at this and go, all right. Cool. What's a bi quad LP? What's you know low pass? What's a bi quad uh, high pass? You know, uh, so I don't even know. And do I care? I don't know. It sounds good the way the instrument is now. Is that a necessary feature? I don't know if it is or not because I haven't been told why it would be useful or where it would be useful. Um, I would just do an EQ cut in Cubase if I needed to, right? Saturation, obviously fantastic. You can add saturation, which would be extra harmonics, which, which could help fatten things up and uh, put things, you know, more in the mix, things stand out. I mean, obviously, parametric EQ, you can enable, disenable. Looks like you have four points here where you can um, adjust the EQ if you want to do that. And then you have the player down here, obviously. Uh, all functions as, as it should. Everything is pretty much what you would think it would be. We got the menu up here. Uh, I think you can use this as standalone if I remember correctly, which I'm obviously not doing. But you can change the driver, your audio device, things like this. And then you have the LFO chain where you can do... <laughs> you can chain together uh, your things that you want to do. Now, um, let's talk more about what I really love about this instrument before I get into the critiques a little bit, okay? What I really love about this instrument is it's atmospheric. Just listen to the... Oh, these are like plucks. Pretty cool. Really like how easy it is to get a reverb and delay that sounds atmospheric. So I just used the built-in delay and reverb of the plugin here. I have no idea what kind of reverb or delay it is. I don't care. But I just really uh, was fond of Freya's Lyre. It's really round. It's very atmospheric, almost like a romantic type of a sound. And it definitely sounds folkish. And what I would what I would expect to hear. So I was a big fan of that. I really liked it, and I gravitated towards it 
instantly. Um, and it was my main writing tool. I actually wrote this entire bit and then used all the other uh, parts of the instrument to fill in the blanks a little bit. Uh, really was fascinated with the lyre, really enjoyed it, and it was very easy to use. You know, very simple to use, simple here. I could change the pitch, I could do whatever I wanted. So I just added a lot of reverb and delay, a little bit of saturation, and then I didn't touch the parametric EQ because this was a preset, and I just left it the way it is. Great, sounds awesome. So the ease of use in terms of getting things to be atmospheric, I think goes a long way because I don't have to insert another plugin, even though I've done. I don't have to do anything else. You can just crank the reverb and the delay, and you can have a really cool atmospheric sounding uh, lyre. Now, originally, it was kind of just like this. It almost sounds kind of sensual, as in like we're really close together, and like I'm sitting on a chair by a fire, and I'm just playing to myself. You know, it sounds kind of romantic as it were in that particular case. Not what I was going for. I wanted something definitely bigger, more atmospheric. And that would fill more space, right? The other thing I really loved about this uh, instrument is all of the textures, soundscapes, and the ability to create atmosphere. Like this was just a preset snowstorm that I picked um, where they have chosen three different samples here. These are all um, available right in the bear in the textures and various submenus here, and it's just so easy to create a landscape, a soundscape. And I like, oh, let me picture it's windy, you know, maybe with snowing, or I know it's raining, uh, and you can create that soundscape, which is a great bed for putting melody on top of it. I mean, if I don't have this in here, this still sounds okay. It's not bad. But with this, adds a whole different dimension to the to the entire composition. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, the percussion side of things. One of the most important things about folk music and, for example, Viking music and, for example, you know, War Druna, the percussion elements are very important. And it's not just like kick drum and snare drum. It's uh, natural percussion, so bones, or using jewelry, or using skin drums. All of these drums are in this sampler. So, you know, if you just come up here to, not that, let's just go here, percussion. Bells, sheep bells, uh, sea shell, rattle, dark percussion, heldum percussion, bones, amulets, uh, all these things that you can, like, for example, like a tambourine, you could use raven bones. Um, and then you can use bells for snare drums or ornaments, you know, things like this. There are drums, so the shaman drums, troll drums, these are just like skin drums that you would expect to, you know, have in the instrument. But they are, they sound exactly what you would think they, they should sound like. You know, let's just go through here. Like, this is like what I consider to be like the hi hat. Now, I'm putting uh, some more ornamentation here on the offbeat with this instrument to just create rhythmic variation and interest. The other reason why I used this one where it had like a sustain, which just lended itself to be like, oh, this is like the end of the sentence, right? So I really liked that particular instrument. Same thing, you know, with the raven bones down here, it's the same thing. It kind of sounds random because you don't have the context of everything else. You know, then we have the shaman drums. Great. And then we have like the kick drum. Great. You know, I just basically started with the deep cave drums here with the kick. Then I put in, like, the snare, you know, the shaman drums too. And then I wanted to have a, a meter symbol, as it were, like hi-hat or a ride. So I found a bell that sounded good, you know, in this kind of pattern, like, like this. 
And then I like the raven bones because the raven bones are almost like the snare. If you listen with the this. But the point is making this rhythmically interesting on the backdrop of the melody that's happening. So with the melody that's happening, I'm a big fan of polyphony. So we have the original melody here, right? Which is just, it's, it's neat. It's very folkish, kind of what you would expect. So that repeats. But then I originally was like, yeah, you know, I want to have another melody going on somewhere, maybe some strings, uh, like a rhythm guitar. Realize something. So I was like, let me find a string patch that I really like. And then I came across the Brahmin strings, which had a real guttural thickness to it that I really liked. I was like, ooh, that'll add some balls to this, right? Because the melody is cute and nice and melodic, but then we have the like the underlying tension, like, wait a minute, you know, this guy, you know, this something could happen here. So just your classic ACDC um, chord progression, which I'm a huge fan of. I don't apologize for it, and I don't care how much Trey Xavier makes fun of me for it. I'm always going to use it because I adore it. Uh, but that being said, it was a bit simplistic. I felt like there could be more interest because we've already heard the liar, right? What else could we do here to make this sonically interesting to listen to? So I was like, let's do another string patch. So that's where the Rohan strings came from. Now, it's really important when you're trying to find instruments. It's kind of similar like rhythm guitar and lead guitar. If you want your lead guitar to pop out, you can't just use the exact same settings with your rhythm guitar on your lead guitar. So I wanted these strings to be different. So we have kind of like a thick guttural type of string patch with the Brahmins. With the Rohans, these are a bit more scratchy. A bit more scratchy up in the high, in the high register. So they automatically stick out. Now, because they automatically stick out a bit more, the ear is automatically drawn to it, which means they're louder, which means you're going to hear that string line first. But when you listen to the song subsequent times, the Brahmin strings will poke out at you, and you're going to be like, oh, that's cool. That's what I really try to go through when I'm writing music. You know, why should you listen to the song multiple times? Like, a great hook is cool. Pop music's great. You could sing the chorus over and over and over. Um, but... You know, the kind of music that I listened to when I was growing up, uh, of Night, you know, Night Side of Clip, Emperor, Cruelty and the Bees, Dust and Her Embrace, there's so much stuff going on that it takes literally a hundred listens. And even then, you're going to be like, I don't remember hearing that note. Okay, that's cool. That's a harmony I didn't hear last time. And with that in mind, I was like, you know what? We have the lyre. We have two string lines that are doing two different harmonies. Let's put another harmony in the middle of all this. So we have the lyre, which is nice and round and romantic and beautiful. So I thought we need to have something that cuts a little bit more. So, bone flute. Now, bone flute. Yeah, bone flute is the one, excuse me, I think, which was out of tune with all the other, all the other instruments. Uh, in particular, it was the deer bone flute sample, not any of these. So I had to pitch it, uh, oop, 30 cents. Basically, I had to listen to the whole song. Um, play a note, and then uh, I played the C note, and the, the other instruments played a C note, and then I changed the pitch and tuning until everything was in tune with each other. Okay, So it's good that those knobs exist so that you can tune accordingly. Uh, not that it's good or bad, that's not what I mean. I mean, like, maybe you're tuned to, like, 432 hertz instead of 440 hertz. That'll be very important, so you can change the tuning of your instrument, for example. So we have this. Pretty neat. One thing I decided to do here when I was 
working with this is I wanted to introduce rhythmic variants because it's it was really boring because C and G it's just like oh my god we're gonna hold these notes forever so I thought you know what would be cool is introduce rhythm sounds very realistic and it's just more interesting to listen to instead of just having two whole notes it would be four whole notes smash against each other um way more interesting to listen to and it breaks up the pattern a little bit and it's another rhythmic variance in the melody and in the instrument itself where it makes it interesting to listen to right because your brain is going to forget about the lyre we've already heard that but it's cool as a background instrument now and when you listen to everything all together Awesome. You know, and then I wanted to have like that power chord. Here's the end, right? So battle horn, uh, I saw that and I was like, oh, that's probably going to be it. Yep, that's the one. And I'm just using it kind of like as a staccato. It's not a staccato, it's not a staccato note, but it's kind of like a punch, like the exclamation point, the period to this particular section, right? And, and that honestly was going to be the original demo, but the one thing that happened with this is that I listened to this and I started playing guitar and all this other stuff that happened at the second half of the song is because of this instrument because I became inspired and melody is just kind of started falling out of my ass and I wrote really different guitar riffs um the, the, I don't particularly write these kind of folky one line guitar riffs like we have here in the beginning <laughs> That's, I usually, I, I don't, I think it's probably one of the first times I've ever written a riff like this before. But that came pretty much because I was doing these uh, rhythmic variations with the deer bone, deer bone flute. So I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. So I don't know what's going to happen to this. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to become a song or a project at some point, but it really turned out great. So as a songwriting um, inf influence, you know, influencing more riffs, more ideas. Awesome. Fantastic. So that's pretty much the overview of the Asgard sampler. It's simple in nature. It's what you see is what you get. But I want to talk about a couple of things here that I think could, could use some improvements. And there's also kind of like the elephant in the room here, like where's Toggle Harpa? All right. So I want to talk about that right now. Uh, the first thing is that this should have a manual. Now, uh, for example, like the synth and LFO, I, I kind of understand how that could be useful and how I might want to use it. All these filter types, most of these, I don't even know what this means. Like, why does it matter? You know, is a Moog different than a Biquad? What's the point? Um, having a manual would at least make it so that I could be like, what the hell is that? Open the manual, go, oh, okay, cool. Uh, if it means something to me, then cool. If not, who cares? But there's a lot of information here I think is missing. Uh, and how someone might miss something. Uh, for example, how why is this synth thing here? What is this sign? What's the sign? What's the triangle? What's the saw? Um, I have a little bit of experience working with waves tables, so I kind of understand my way around this, but I'm definitely not an expert. And I'm sure there are people um, who, who don't even know as much as I do, which is very little, by the way, <laughs> not trying to say I know a lot, who would be like, what's the point of this? So a manual, um, definitely talking about all the functionality of the of the instrument is pretty much required. You know, given the price of this instrument is 250 bucks with a lot of functionality and powerful functionality, by the way, you're kind of just leaving money on the table and not telling people how to uh, take full advantage of your instrument. So definitely take the time to do a manual. Um, if you If you don't have anyone that can do it, uh, I have lots of experience copywriting and doing manuals for companies. I've done company. I've done manuals for Aurora DSP. I've done manuals for Specter Digital. So if you want to reach out to me, we can get a manual done for you. We'd be happy to help you. But a, a manual is absolutely nece necessary for an instrument like this uh, with so many things going on. The preset browser is 
a little bit kind of weird. The first thing uh, is that there's no default. I'm not going to click that now because that'll kill me. There's no default preset. So one of the things that you're going to find out, you're going to use this, you're going to go through a preset, you're going to derp around, and you're going to be like, okay, that was fun. I just want to reset, I want to reset the functionality of the plugin. Um, there should be a default preset in order to do that. And what I was like, okay, I'll just make my own, which is easy to do, by the way. And I really, really think this favorite star is a genius idea. I really like that. But I, I came down here, I'm like, okay, I'm going to add. Okay, add. You, add, you actually have to add a folder here, and then you add a folder in the middle section, and then all your presets will be over here. Okay, I, I get all that. You know, like if I want to make a, a soundscape thing, that's fine. But I can put it in various, make a default folder, and then default. I mean, okay, I get it, but that was kind of weird. More steps and clicks than I felt was necessary, but... It works and everything loads. Everything's fantastic. There are no problems. The other thing I want to mention is that if, uh, depending on the power of your computer, that's going to be one of the limiting factors for you. I have an AMD 5900X, generally regarded as a pretty powerful, good computer. Um, probably as a CPU for audio production, probably shouldn't have to touch it for many, 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 many years. Okay. Uh, RAM, I have 32 gigs of RAM. Um, I have 10 instances of this Asgard sampler here, and it plays without a hitch. However, the moment I load loaded in the 11th, started to have some glitches and some issues. Things weren't working correctly. Um, I detailed this all in a Word document that I've given to Uragar. Uh, but basically, the TLDR for you guys is that once the 11th instrument came in, uh, if I were to play Cubase here, you see how the time indicator is moving perfectly, no problem. Once the 11th one came in and I was looking at the GUI here, uh, it was stutter, um, you know, it was like really low FPS, it felt like in a game, and the, the Cubase started to be sluggish in terms of responsiveness. Please keep in mind, guys, I'm talking about having the 11th instance of this plugin open. I don't think it's unreasonable, okay? I, I'm just reporting at what point I started to have some weird behavioral issues. The second weird thing that would happen was that um, the the F the F5 key would play. I would insert it. I would play any key. It didn't matter, and the F5 key would play at the same time, and it would be held. So it was completely ruining any more you know songwriting things like this. But once again, guys, I'm talking about having the eleventh instance of a plugin here, which you know it, that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I was trying to see how far I could push it, what I could do. It wasn't it wasn't a deal breaker, but again, uh, 5900X with 32 gigs of RAM, uh, I don't know how many instances I should be able to load because I see down here, you know, what CPU I'm using and how much RAM something is taking. So I felt like perhaps um, I should be able to load more, but maybe I could be wrong, okay? But that's how I felt about that. Now, the elephant in the room, guys. So where's the toggle harpa? This is one of the, this is hard for me to talk about. Um, one of the major elements of having a folk instrument is a toggle harper. You can't have a Viking instrument without a toggle harper. Now, I'm not saying that there's not one here. Here it is. The issue I have is that there are about 50 articulations here, but they're just random articulations you know it's like if i'm i'm gonna so if, if i'm gonna do like c minor right i should be able to go you know c d uh d sharp you know and then all the way up but listen to what happens so when it comes to creating deliberate melodies you're kind of shit out of luck now the toggle harper itself is a polyphonic instrument, so it doesn't. Re you can't just like play it in C minor. I mean, it doesn't work like that. There's always polyphonic drone strings that are happening. But uh, I was expecting to have, for example, like a drone string that I could trigger, right, and then maybe have um, a highlight of how many notes I could actually feasibly play with that drone string playing. But in this case, uh, the songwriting method you really have to employ here is just randomness. You should. And it looks like you just need to click around until you get something that sounds cool. 
Um, honestly, the best way to do this would be to get a MIDI controller, just hit record, and just play keys until you get something that kind of sounds cool. I'm not bashing this songwriting style. I, for the gods know, I've definitely come up with some rips before where I just went like this on a keyboard by accident, and somehow a melody was born. I'm not, I'm not saying that that method is wrong or incorrect or not legitimate. I'm just saying that when it comes to, for example, I was writing a song in C minor and I wanted to use a toggle harpa in C minor, it came out to be that I can't. So writing more deliberate melodies, kind of a pain in the ass. And I really became frustrated because I wanted to have a long, I wanted to have like a loop sort of kind of like this because you, when you, you when you're holding it and you and you string it like this jing 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 it's like rhythmic right and i thought oh it'd be really cool this is like what is this 105 bpm i could go ring 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 that'd be kind of cool right well then you get here and i'm trying to find the attacks not right the decays are too you know whatever not right i mean I could come up here and start messing with the attack decay sustain release knobs, but then anyway, I still have to figure out what each key does. And this to me kind of killed, um, kind of killed it for me. I, I was, you know, I, I'm very, very sad to actually report this functionality because this really just kind of like, no, because I love this sampler actually. I think this is. Um, when it comes to ryth rhythm writing rhythmic things, it is so easy to do it, to do it with a sampler. And I'm kind of bummed that, like, for me, I just have no use for the toggle harpa. And what the hell is a Viking instrument without a toggle harpa? You just you have to have one. So it is here, and it does sound cool, but you have to know that it's just fifty. I'm gonna say random articulations in C minor, whatever this means, and you're just going to have to click around until you get something that you like that sounds cool. 100% um, chance that you eventually will find a rhythm that sounds amazing, that sounds cool, and you'll build an entire song off of it. I have no doubt that you'll be able to do that. But just keep in mind that that's the technique that you're going to have to use. There is no, as far as I can tell, there is no deliberate songwriting thing here. I could be wrong, but again, there's no manual that tells me which key is which is which articulation or which instrument. So, if there was an indication of which key did which, which articulation, I could probably pick and choose and go, okay, this is a sustain. This is a sustain. Anyway, I don't want to go too deep into that. Uh but that's you need I think you need to know that cuz the website didn't make it particularly obvious that that's how the instrument functions the same is for the jaw harp it's exactly the same there's no there's no uh, articulation list i don't know what note does what so you, there's no way to use it in a scale or find the note or how to use it you know it's just various sounds and various notes that sound fantastic by the way this is why I'm so bummed to have to talk about this, but I think you guys need to know, and it's a very, it's very important that you know how the, the instrument functions. So, given the jaw harp and the toggle harpa <laughs> kind of don't work the way that I personally would want them to, uh, that was a little bit disappointing. But as I say, when it comes to the other instruments, the the flutes, you can see all makes sense. You you see the range that you have here of notes that you can use. They all sound really good. Just add some reverb. It's it's fucking incredible. Like it's really good. I'm just I don't know how they could make that decision with the toggle harp and the 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 the, the, the jaw harp. But um, uh, that's it. I don't want to go through everything every single preset. I don't see the point, and it, it'll be just like extra time in the video for that makes no sense. So let me just give my two cents, and I'll close out the video. Uh, is this plugin worth getting? Absolutely. The rhythms are outstanding. The rhythm is incredible. I really love the drums. It's very easy to write. Uh, they load up fast. They load up instantly. You can create complex rhythms with actual 
Viking Age instruments that are authentic and sound authentic. I love the percussion elements of this of this instrument. I love the uh, soundscapes that you can come up with. Let me show here. The, look at the textures. Various, okay? You have pads. This instrument will be fantastic for creating soundscapes, for creating backgrounds, for creating atmosphere, so that you can write a melody on top of it. Uh, the lyre, mm, the lyre is amazing, okay? The drums here are fantastic. The instruments, aside from the jaw harp and the toggle harpa, I have... Literally no complaints. Um, some small gripes, like you should have a manual for this. I don't. You, absolutely, there's so much functionality here. Not everyone's going to be able to figure it out or know how things are supposed to work. Uh, the preset browser was kind of weird. It works fine though. I mean, it saves all the presets. It's whatever. It's good to go. And some instruments might not be in tune with each other, but that's fine because basically they have the pitch and tune knobs here, so that you can fix that based by ear, based on ear, your ears. Uh, could be, could suck if you're not able to hear things that are out of tune or when things are in tune, but you know, they at least they have the pitch and tune knobs there so that you can fine tune and you can change things to put things in, in tune with each other. So overall for the atmosphere, the textures, the pads, uh, the, the flutes, the horns, the drums, uh, absolutely can recommend this 100%. It's easily, it's a very a easy instrument to use. For the rhythm section um it gets points docked off because of the toggle harper and the jaw harp i really really hope that they could find a way to at the very least restructure the keyboard pattern or include a manual to tell us which key does what so that the writing can be more deliberate right but other than that i had a lot of fun working with the sampler and you can bet your ass that when it comes to doing viking style drums or nordic folk style drums this is going to be in my session because it is so easy to use and so easy to write for okay so once again radar uh radar i can't say it the norwegian way you'll just have to forgive me uh frostwave audio thank you so much again for sponsoring the video i really hoped that uh you found it valuable and anyone who's thinking of picking this up is definitely worth the money it's really hard to find top quality viking instruments right now uh, or in general that don't sound like synth patches and stuff like this uh it's definitely worth it just keep in mind you know about the toggle harpa and the jaw harp okay uh that'll do it for me guys hope you enjoyed the video see you in the next one